I love the fact that we have a group of 20-year-olds up here leading us in, uh, in worship. I uh, realized this past week that I'm not the young guy anymore. Now, I've always been the young guy. You know, when I was a youth pastor, I was like the young guy. And then I, I spoke in churches for about two and a half years, and my wife and I traveled. We went to a different church almost every weekend and spoke. And, and every time I would show up, uh, they would say, oh, we, we heard about you, but we didn't think you were so young. And then I got here to the church, and when, when we came here, I was 29 years old, and I was the young pastor. This past week, uh, I was in the office. Actually, I came up behind our gym, and we had, like, junk everywhere behind our gym. And so when I saw it, I came in the office. First thing I did is I went to Caleb's office, and, and I said, Caleb, I, I need some help, man. We got junk all over in the back. I said, it's starting to look like Sanford and Son back there. And he looked back at me, and he said, Sanford who? Who's Sanford? I was like, I am no longer the, the young guy around here any longer. Uh, we're in this series called Perfect Love. I'm so glad you guys are here today. We're in part three of this series, but even if you haven't been here for part one, part two, I'm going to catch you up to speed. We're going to be good to go. But before we jump into this, this message today from 1 John, uh, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2 today, verses 7 through 11. Uh, but I was uh, on, online, and online I came across the, this company called GLM. It's the Global Language Monitoring Company. And what they do is they actually scour through 250,000 uh, news and media outlets. So they, they go through every piece of print, uh, whether it be in print, whether it be online. Uh, they go through all of, they go through hundreds and thousands of blogs. Uh, last year they added Twitter. And what they're looking for, they're monitoring all the language to be able to find the top word or the top phrases that we use here in the United States of America. So they, they got this list in 2014, and so I want to share with you the top five, all right? Show my age again, David Letterman style. So I, I'm going to start with number five. I'm going to bring it down to uh, the, the most used words in our language. So number five, 2014, was the word nano, nano. Nano meaning very small, like an iPod nano, okay, like a nano car, a, a nanosecond. That was a big word. Anybody use the word nano, okay, last year? All right, they didn't monitor in here. <laughs> Number four thing spoken about last year, news media, so, social media, uh, everything else, was the blood moon. The blood moon, this is a big thing, you know, four eclipses, total eclipse of the heart, you know, four eclipses over an 18 month period of time. And here, I'm, I'm about to give you some Christian humor, okay? Nine out of 10 of you aren't gonna get this, but if you'll look really close in the blood moon, you know what you're gonna see inside the, John Hagee in there, okay? John, John Hagee, he, he loved to talk about the blood moons, okay? Uh, number three, you may not know the blood moon or John Hagee, but some of you may be more familiar with the next word, which is a vape, okay? <laughs> Stands for, uh, you know, short for vaporizing, and I'm sure California and Colorado, we contributed, okay, to this being the uh, number three word used, uh, 2014. Number two uh, word phrase used uh, was hashtag. Hashtag 2014. Some of you that are old school, you may remember this as the pound sign, okay? It's, it's the pound sign. Okay, and uh, the number one word or phrase used in 2014 for the very first time, okay? The, the GLM's been doing this for over a decade. Number one, for the very first time, it wasn't a word and it wasn't a phrase. It was the heart emoji, the heart emoji was used more than anything else in online print, uh, making, you know, every, with social media. It was the online heart emoji. Now, I'm just kind of curious. How many of you use emojis? Would you just raise your hand if you use, yeah, a lot. How many of you know someone that uses emojis too much? Would you just, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorites just came out. I posted this on my Facebook wall. Uh, I love this one. The difference between a man and a woman in emojis. There's a man's day, and then a woman's day. Now, before you crucify me, 
I'm just going to take a poll here real quick. You just tell me, okay? True or false? You just declare, all right? On the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. True. Yeah, true. Absolutely. Now, I digress. I digress. Back to the heart emoji today. We're in this series called Perfect Love. And in this series, we've been studying through the book of 1 John. And for those of you that may have missed week one, week two, for those of you that may have forgotten about week one or week two, let me just bring you back up to speed. John is the author. This is the same John that was a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the same John that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Now, he wrote that original gospel as an eyewitness of Jesus' account. So he was there at the feeding of the 5,000, and he wrote the story about it. He was there whenever Jesus healed the blind man, and he wrote the story about it. He was there. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He followed Jesus. He was one of the 12 disciples. Now, the difference between John and 1 John, same guy, but he wrote 1 John in his latter years. Remember the polite way of saying this? He was in his advanced years. And he had a lot of gray hair. And now he is speaking uh, as one of the last. He was the last apostle that was still alive. The other, they had been martyred for their faith. I mean, people said, you're a Christian. They killed him. John is the only one left. And so John, with a lot of gray hair, he begins to write to a new generation. Because when he wrote this, it was 50 to 60 years after Jesus had died on the cross and ascended, went back into heaven. So you have this new generation uh, that are wanting to know more about God, wanting to follow God with their life. And John says, let me tell you what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And the same thing that he told them is is just as true today as it was whenever he wrote this letter. And he says, there are some certain characteristics that you know that you're an authentic follower of Jesus, that you're not a pretender, you're not a poser, you're not a fake, if you have these things in your life, if you reflect these things. So 1 John chapter 1, here's what he says. You have to reflect joy in your life. You know that you're a follower of Jesus, an authentic believer, if you have joy. Now, joy isn't like a personality trait. It's like happy and peppy and bursting with joy. If that were the case, some of you would be here and say, "Ah, that's not me. See, and that's not what joy is. Here's what joy is. Joy is whenever you're on the mountaintop and you're able to say that every good gift and perfect gift is from above. And God, I praise you. Just like these parents that dedicated their children to be able to say, God, you are the author of all joy. And I celebrate what you have done in my life. And I celebrate what you're currently doing in my life. Because God, joy comes from you. And joy is attached to Jesus. And you're inside of me. And I've got joy because of it. But joy is also whenever you can be in the valley. And you can say, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't have to fear evil because Jesus is inside of me. And when Jesus is inside of me, even in my darkest places, I can still have joy in my life. See, happiness is based upon happenings. If your happenings are good, you can be happy. But joy is deeper and richer than that. Joy is found in Jesus. So he says, you're going to reflect joy in your life. Then he says, the second thing that you're going to reflect in your life, if you're an authentic follower, is truth. You're going to follow truth. Do you know, every day, I read three things. I read the Bible, I read the newspaper, and I try to read a good book almost every day. And the reason why I read the Bible is so I can know who's telling me the truth. Because the newspaper is going to lie to me at times. Books, they're not always going to tell me the truth. But John says this, the truth will... So if you want freedom, freedom is found in truth. So he says, authentic followers of Jesus, they're going to reflect joy. They're going to reflect truth. And then he says in 1 John chapter 1, they're also going to reflect light. He says that when you are in Jesus, you are going to have the light shine out of your life. I love the metaphor that Paul uses. He says that we're all broken. We're all broken people. And he says that because of our brokenness, he said we're like like a pot. We're like a cracked pot. Not a crack pot but a cracked pot. And he says, through our brokenness, the brokenness of this pot, the light is inside and the light shines through. That we're going to reflect light. Paul said this, in my weakness, you're strong. See, God can take your brokenness, he can take your misery, and he can turn it into a ministry. He can use your hurt to be able to bring hope to other people. 
That's what it means to be able to reflect light in your life. Then he goes on First John chapter 2. This is what we studied last week. He says that you're not only going to reflect joy, you're not only going to reflect uh, truth, you're not only going to reflect light. He said, but you're also going to be obedient. He says, you're going to obey God. When God calls you to do something, you're going to do it. And he says, we're all going to have the struggle with sin. But if we will obey God, he said, then you're going to sin less. Doesn't mean you're going to be sinless. It means that you're going to sin less. And now we come today to 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, and we're going to find the fifth thing that displays if you're an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't have this, he says, you're not a true follower of Jesus. And here's the fifth thing. It's love. It's love. Love is going to be a way of life for you. That if you're an authentic follower of Jesus, you are going to be marked by love. Here's what John said, John chapter 13. You'll know that they are my disciples if they show love one for another. Now let's look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 7. Here, here's how he starts it off. He says, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. He said, this isn't brand new what I'm about to tell you. Rather, it's an old one that you've had from the very beginning. He said, the old commandment to love one another is the same message that you heard before, yet it's also new. It's kind of like the heart emoji. Okay, it's like, we've heard about love. Love has been a foundation of our life. I mean, you know, many poets have written about love. Songs have been written about love. Love has been there from the beginning of time. But guess what? We now have the heart emoji. And it says that it's the same thing, but it's also new. It's also fresh. It's as fresh as it was the day it was dispensed, the day that it's delivered, and it's not stale. Now, let's break this down. He says, I'm writing, I'm not writing a new commandment. He said, this is an old commandment. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, it was the very first time that Jesus told his people, I want you to love God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This in Israel is called the Shema. It's, it's the most important command. Okay, and then in Leviticus chapter 19, he added to it, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. So, so this isn't anything new. He said it's old. Then what he did is he gave us the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are basically love God, love other people. There's ten of them. The first four all have to do with our vertical relationship with God, our, our relationship with God. So it says like this, you know, don't have any other idols. Make sure that I'm the Lord your God only. Uh, don't take my name in vain. Listen, honor the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. That's the first four. Then what he does is he transitions the next six are all about loving other people. So he says, if you love other people, you're not going to covet. You're not going to murder. You're not going to commit adultery. And it just keeps going down the line. Now, then in Matthew, Jesus came on the scene, Matthew chapter 22, 37, 38, 39. He says, you can take all the commandments, take everything in the Old Testament, and you can bring them back down to two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbors yourself. He said, take all the commandments, and you can hang on these two right here. So here it is. Cliff notes of the Bible. Love God. Love people. And there's a symbol for this that you'll never forget. It's the cross. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. So he says, this isn't anything new that I'm about to tell you. He says, it's actually something old. Now, the reason why he said that this isn't a new commandment is because in John's day and time, there was this philosophy called Gnosticism. There were these people that were labeled Gnostics. And to be a Gnostic, to, to believe in Gnosticism, is to have a new revelation it meant to be enlightened it basically means that that all of a sudden you got a new revelation and john says be very leery of people that have this gnosticism belief that say god has told me something brand new and i would say the same thing to you be careful of people that say god has taught us something brand new Listen, I, I just want to share with you that this is an old commandment. It's still fresh and new as it was the day it was given. But any, any faith that begins to talk more about a person or is built on anybody else other than Jesus Christ, you better beware of. 
He says, listen, this isn't an old thing, this is a new thing. And, and here's the thing about philosophy. Gnosticism has to do with philosophy. And Gnosticism is still around today. And philosophy, th- these are, this is basically the belief that I can, I'm very smart, I'm very brilliant, and, and I'm thinking with my mind, and I can do mental gymnastics. But morally, my life is in a gutter. See, in, in philosophy, your belief is separate from your behavior. And, and here's what John's saying. He's saying, as a follower of Jesus, don't turn your mind off. But here's what he's saying. They're integrated together. Your belief and your behaviors, they have to match up. They have to align. So John says, listen, we're going to go back to the basics. Let's go back, 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 back to the very beginning. It's old, but it's also new. And he says, let's talk about this foundation of love because it's the mark of a follower of Jesus. I love that he went right back to the basics. It reminded me the story of legendary coach John Wooden. You know, I, I love basketball. John Wooden was, the, I believe, the greatest coach of all time. Ten national championships at UCLA. So I love the story of John Wooden. Uh, he, he gets all of his athletes together for the very first day of practice. And Bill Walton, okay, Hall of Fame basketball player, he tells the story of the very first day at practice with legendary coach John Wooden. And he said at the very first day of practice, he said, Coach Wooden set us down and said, listen, I am about to teach you something right now that is a lesson that you're going to need to know for the rest of your life. So he says, don't miss it. All these collegiate athlete basketball players are leaning in to the words of John Wooden. And here's what he tells them. Guys, take off your socks and shoes, and I'm going to show you how to put them on properly. (laughs) So I'm about to tell you the foundation of life right here. Don't miss it. Take off your socks and shoes. He says, if there's wrinkles in your socks and your shoes aren't tied properly, you're going to develop blisters. And then with blisters, you're going to miss practice. And if you miss practice, you're not going to play. And if you don't play... We can't win games. Here's what he said. I got a quote from from John Wooden. He says, if you want to win championships, you got to take care of the smallest of details. See, and this is what John said. Not John Wooden, but the John we're studying today from 1 John. He said, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the most important things. Listen, here's how you put your socks on. Here's how you put your shoes on. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but let's make sure we get this done correctly. He says, it's about loving other people. Now, I don't know if you know this, but John was actually called the apostle of love. They called him the apostle of love. But he wrote more about love than any of the other books in the Bible. So if you, you read the book of John, you read through 1 John, uh, 2 John, 3 John, it's about love. He's called the apostle of love. But did you know that he wasn't always known for his love? Do you know at one time in John's life, uh, or in his early years, he had a real temper issue. I mean, he had a short fuse. I mean, John could just explode that fast. You ever know anybody like that? You ever know anybody that just, you know, they, they can like dial it up to an 11, you know, like that fast. It's like, what's wrong with you? I, re- I remember when I was in college and I was at McDonald's with my friend Jeremy. And uh, we were just uh, sitting there eating a Big Mac. And this girl walked in, and, and we noticed this girl, but she went to the bathroom, and that was that. Then all of a sudden, not long after that, this guy came in, and he said, Hey, I saw you checking out my girlfriend. And we're like, what? We're, we're checking out your girlfriend? He's like, yeah, you were. I saw you. And he just, like, keeps, like, jaw- he was like a little chihuahua, just, like, yapping at us. And he was this little bitty guy. And, we're, and he was like, you want to fight? Let's fight. I was like... Dude, we would mess you up. You don't want to fight us. Next thing we know, he walks away, and he walks in with eight of his friends. There's me and my friend Jeremy. Jeremy's like, you're going to get us killed, man. They stare us down as they walk in. Then they walk over to go order. And as they go up to go order, Jeremy's like, dude, we got to get out of here. So we're like, let's slip out of here as fast as we can. So we take our trays, and just as, we, just as I am like putting the tray all right, in the little trash can there, right when I turned around, didn't even see it coming, that girl came out of the bathroom and she punched me right in the face. Like, not a slap, like a punch. And I turned around like, Phew. I'm like, are you kidding me? 
And so all of a sudden, I look up, and me and Jeremy, we see all these guys, like, staring us down. And so we take off running out of the McDonald's. And as we're running, fortunately, as we're running for the car, we're, we got a little bit of time because I look back, and these guys are, like, taking their shirts off. It's like, why are you taking your shirts? It's like, it's like, we don't want to get blood on our shirts, all right? We're going to mess these guys up. So we get in the car. Right when we get in the car, one of the guys, like, reaches into the car, and Jeremy, like, slams his arm. The guy's like, oh, and I remember he had to have broke his arm. Then these guys are all around us, and they punched the driver's side window and shattered the glass on us. It was, like, crazy, ridiculous. And we pulled out of there, and then, then we go back to college. And, and Jeremy, my friend, he, he tells all the guys, like, you won't believe it. Brian got beat up by a girl. <laughs> Talk about, you know, these guys just like ramping it up. It's like, what? That's the way John was in his life. One of my favorite stories is found in Luke about John. This is in his, his younger days, in his early days. And, and here's what the scripture says. It says, the people of the village, they didn't welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. So these people, they had a problem with Jesus. They had a problem that he was going to go to Jerusalem talk to the people. So watch this. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? What's a, it's like, what? It's like, John, John's like, Jesus, man, they're not welcoming you. I mean, you're Jesus. Let's kill them. Call down fire from heaven, God. This is it. Take them out. And you know what Jesus does? He turned and he rebuked them. He's like, John, James, chill out, guys. It's okay. No need to, like, flip a lid. And here's the point. God was able to take this very angry man who had a very short fuse, and he was able to turn him into the apostle of love. And for some of you, you're here, and you're angry, and, and you're bitter, and you, you, you know, a- anger is basically a sign that you can't control somebody else. So you just, like, explode. It's like, they owe me something, and I'm going to get it back. And God is able to take that attitude. He's able to turn it back and say, you can become a person of love. Some of you are married to somebody that has anger issues. And I'm here to tell you that there's hope for them. God can turn them into a person of love. Some of you have parents or you have children that are explosive. And I'm here to tell you that our God is big enough that he can actually turn a person with an anger issue into a person of love. God can do that. So here's what he says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. He goes on. He said, Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. This commandment, love God, love people. Jesus modeled it for us. He displayed it for us. I think one of the, the most amazing pictures of his love was when they were in the upper room, right before Jesus went to the cross, right before, you know, Judas betrayed him. He got all the disciples together, and they shared their final meal together. He had spent three and a half years with these guys, and he knew this was it. He knew he was getting ready to go to the cross. So he pulls them all together. And now if I'm Jesus, here's what I would do. I would say, guys, listen, I'm getting ready to leave. Okay, I'm getting ready to die. But so you know, you're going to start the church. And since I know you guys are going to start the church, and I mean for thousands of years after this, it's your job to like, you know, continue to pass the flame to the next generation. Here's what I would do if I'm Jesus. Get your notepads out, guys. We got to cram. I'm getting ready to leave. There's a lot you need to know right now. Guys, listen up. We're not going to sleep tonight. Listen, I got a lot to tell you. But that's not what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did? All of those disciples, they, they flood in to this upper room. And Jesus goes over, and he grabs a towel, and he grabs a basin filled with water, and he goes over to each one of those disciples one by one, and he gets on his knees, and he pulls off their sandals. And the same hands that formed the sun, moon, and stars, the same hands that created this incredible playground that we call Earth, Those fingers are now massaging filthy, dirty toes. And he's wiping the dirt off their feet as a symbol of his love for them, as a picture of what it means to love God and love other people. Jesus 
lived the truth of this commandment, to love God and love people. John goes on, he says in verse 9, he says, If anyone claims that they're living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in the darkness. He says an authentic follower of Jesus Christ is going to reflect love. They're not going to have hate in their heart. He says, anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light. When you love other people, you are displaying that you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And you don't cause other people to stumble. But verse 11, anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. And when you're in darkness, you stumble, don't you? It's like, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night and I got young kids and you know, it's like, I'll step, I can't see anything. You know what I do? Step on a Lego. You ever done that? It's like, oh, it's like a form of torture, okay? It's like stepping on a Lego. And, and when you're in darkness, you stumble, you mess up. I scream, wake everybody else up in the house. That's what happens when you're living in darkness. But he says, whenever you have the light on, when you're living in the light, he says, then you don't cause other people to stumble. He says, anyone who hates another brother or sister still living and walking in darkness, such a person does not know the way to go because they've been blinded by the darkness. Here's what John is saying. Watch this. This is important. It's impossible to be right with God and wrong with another follower of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. You cannot be right with God and wrong with your parents. Can't do it. You cannot be right with God and wrong with your kids. It's impossible to be right with God and wrong with your spouse. God says, here, here's what John's saying. He's saying, your vertical relationship hinges on your horizontal relationships. It's about loving God and loving other people. Now, this doesn't mean, okay, that, that you're, you're gonna agree with everybody. You know, I, one well-known pastor from Florida, he said this. <laughs> this is pastor humor, by the way. He says, there's nothing wrong with my congregation that a couple of funerals wouldn't fix. Pastor Huber, Pastor Huber. Listen to me, though. Ministry leaders are like, yeah, oh, yeah. No, listen. If you hate another follower of Jesus, there is something radically wrong with your faith. There's something radically wrong with your faith. Now, what does it mean to hate? This doesn't mean that you're not going to have personality conflicts with people doesn't mean that you're always going to see eye to eye with everyone around you. Listen, at our church, we have growth groups. These are groups of 8, 10, 12, 15 people that, that meet together weekly. Uh, we've got 40, 50 groups. How many of you are in a group? Raise your hand if you're in a group. Here's what we tell people that are, that are in a group. Every group has an EGR. An EGR stands for an extra grace required person. Every group has an EGR, and, and if you don't know who the EGR is in your group, you might be the EGR. <laughs> okay, so when John's talking about, you know, hating your brother, he's not talking about, hey, you know what, I got an EGR, I need to show him a little extra grace. He's not talking about, like, personality difficulties. What he's talking about is he's talking about hate. So what is hate? Hate isn't an occasional outburst of anger. Here's what hate is. It's an attitude of your heart that becomes a habit. It's, it's whenever you have hate in your heart towards somebody and you don't even feel remorseful about it. When you have so much anger towards someone, so much bitterness towards them. Here, here's what love is. Love is the opposite of hate. And love is not perfection. That's impossible. Love is not perfection, but love is the direction of your life. It's not perfection, it's the direction. It says that this is what I'm going to lead with, to love God and to love other people. Now, the ultimate test of perfect love is this. Who do you love that someone else may find unlovely? Do you love somebody that's difficult to love? 
That's the Old Testament. Look, I mean, face it. If somebody is easy to love, it's easy to love them back, right? I mean, somebody really loves you, sacrifices for you, encourages you, praises you, pats you on the back, does whatever they can to serve you and help you. That's like easy to love that person. The true test of love is loving somebody that's difficult to love. When they don't reciprocate back to you and then continue to show love to them. Here at Crosspoint Church, we have eight core values. You, you can read them on the back wall. And these eight values, they're, they're, the, they're what we are obsessed about here. They're the DNA of our church. And, and we want these DNA, you know, the, these core values to not only be like part of our church, but part of your life as well. They're biblical values. They're God's values. We say it like this. We believe that God so loved the world. So we refuse any form of prejudice. We love freely and we love frequently with no strings attached. Now, each one of our values is rooted in God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8 says, love never fails. Love never fails. Now, each one of our core values has a question behind them. Because we want to test our values to see how we're doing. Listen, a lot of companies, a lot of businesses, they'll like take their mission statement, their vision statement, their values, and they'll, they'll put them on the wall. But I would suggest this. It doesn't matter what's on the wall. What matters is what's happening in the hall. What's happening around everybody else. So here's our test on our core value here. And I want to test you on it. Who do you love that somebody may find unlovely? Who do you love in your life right now that's hard to love, and yet you continue to love them? Somebody come to mind? Don't look at your spouse right now, okay? <laughs> Don't like... <laughs> Who do you love that someone may find unlovely? Because this is the true test of your heart. It's an awesome thing to be able to say, to the best of my knowledge, I don't hate anybody. To the best of my knowledge, I don't have any bitterness inside of me. I don't have any unforgiveness in me. I don't have any hate. I don't have any ill feelings. And some of you are here and you're like, listen, you don't know what they said. You don't know what they've done. Now, let me, just, let me just say this real quick. Quick little timeout. I'm not talking about, ladies, some guy who's abused you. Listen, that, that guy, you, you don't need to, like, show love. You need to, like, call the police. You need to, like, get out. Okay? What I'm talking about, though, is some of the hatred and some of the things that we have filled in our heart. And, and you say, well, I can't, I can't let them off the hook. There's no way I'm going to let them off the hook. Here's what Romans chapter 12 says. Romans chapter 12, if you've been hurt, if somebody's offended you, this is one of the best verses you can memorize. It says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Notice it says, do all you can do. You cannot control other people's behavior, but you can control yourself. So do all you can do to live at peace with everyone. Dear friends, never, never, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Do you hear that? For scripture says, God says, I will take refuge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So here's what you're going to do. You say, I can't let them off the hook. You're going to let them off of your hook. And you're going to put them on God's hook. And God says, listen, I see it. I see every hurt. I see every offense. I'll take care of it. Let me take care of it. Church, this is what it means to reflect God's love in your life. Love God. Love people. I'll share with you one last story. I read the story about this guy who was, he was out in the dark and he saw this man coming toward him and he had this light that was just kind of, you know, fledgering in and he sees the light. He thought this guy was drunk as he walked toward him. And then as he got a little closer, he realized that this was a blind man holding a flashlight. And he thought to himself, why would a blind man hold a flashlight? So he asked the guy and the guy smiled and he said, listen, I can't help being born blind, but I hold my flashlight so that other people don't have to stumble. I want to take a little quote that Jerry Thorpe talked about a couple weeks ago, and I want to kind of twist it some to make it match this meeting, to make it match this message. Here's what he said. He said that you can't do anything to hurt the character of God. God's character is intact, but here it is. An unloving person can hurt the reputation of God. 
And so what we need to do is as believers, other people are going to stumble, but we're going to shine our light. We're going to let our light be an example so that other people don't stumble. So I'll leave you with this. Imagine what it would be like. Imagine with me just for a moment. If you were able to remove every trace of hatred, bitterness, wrath inside of you. Imagine with me just for a moment how it would feel. Imagine with me how it would feel to know that you could go to bed at night and have a clear conscience. To know that you could sleep like a baby because as far as is possible with you, you've lived at peace with everyone. Imagine how it would feel just for a moment if you've hurt other people, if you did everything in your power to be able to make it right. Imagine how it would feel if you actually said you were sorry. Imagine how it would feel if you took some responsibility. Imagine how you would sleep at night if you just said, you know what? I have a clear conscience inside of me. To the best of my knowledge, I don't hate anybody. To the best of my knowledge, I've made as much right as I can make right. Imagine how it would feel if you reflected joy in your life. Imagine how it would feel if you reflected truth. Imagine with me, just for a moment, how you would feel if you reflected the light out inside of you. Imagine what it would be like to obey God. And when God says, here's what I want you to do, that you're at a place where you say, God, I trust you so much that I will obey you. And imagine how it would feel if you reflected love outside of you. If you had so much of God's love in you that you couldn't help but give it out. Here's the thing. I'll leave you with this. So many times we think that we want other people to love us. And I just need somebody to love me. But really what you need is you need to love somebody else. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for 1 John. I thank you for the lessons that it's teaching us on what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus. God, that is my heart prayer for myself. That is my heart's desire for everyone that's listening to this message by podcast, everybody that's watching the video, and everybody that is here live as well. God, may we follow your example to love God and love people. And God, at the end of the day, may people say, I know that they are a disciple of Jesus because they show love one for another. In Jesus' name I pray, all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, church, let's do it. Let's take our heart emojis and let's flood them out on social media. But even more importantly, let's go to the people that we come in contact. And may we pass the love of Jesus Christ to other people.